Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. <coughs> as you probably know, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath School Department uh, for the months of July, August, and September of 2013. This particular series of 13 lessons is entitled Revival and Reformation, and this is lesson five in that series entitled Obedience, the Fruit of Revival, it's a lesson for August 3 of 2013. We would really encourage you to get your Bibles, have them handy. We're going to look at some verses and look at some stories in the Bible. And if you by any chance do decide that it might be useful to you, our materials that we use in preparation for our discussion here are available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, theox dot O-R-G. So now we would encourage you to bow your heads with us for a word of prayer as we begin our study. Our loving Father, we once again have gathered in your presence. We want to recognize that you're here. We want to recognize our great need for the kind of experience that happened at Pentecost so many years ago. Lord, we don't want just a flurry of emotion. We don't want just some kind of activity. We want a change in our lives that makes us represent you, that makes us shining lights for the truth of the gospel to all around us. Forgive us where we may have failed to do that. Encourage us through the guidance of your Holy Spirit to move forward in our Christian experience is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, in this lesson, we're discussing the impact of revival and reformation on the lives of those who truly receive the Holy Spirit. The impact of what? <clears throat> revival and reformation on the lives of those who truly receive the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not going to ask you in this room right now to tell me whether or not you have received the Holy Spirit, but that's a fair question, isn't it? Have you received the Holy Spirit? Well, look back at the former reign and the Pentecostal experience. We recognize that thousands of people were converted in a day. Now, I'm going to stop there for a second and ask a question. Do you think that those thousands of people who were converted that day it was the first time they had ever heard anything about Christianity? Most, no. no. <clears throat> what had they heard before? They'd heard Jesus. They'd seen Jesus perform miracles. They'd heard him teaching. They'd mm -hmm. thought about it, but just weren't convinced. Many of them had even been healed by Jesus, probably. A lot yeah. of them were probably lined up on the wall while he was being crucified, too. And a lot of them were priests and Pharisees. That's a very interesting point. Look at Acts 6, verse 7. And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests accepted the faith. Who? A great number of priests? I thought those were the avowed enemies of Jesus. When he was alive, they were. Many of them were. And now I turn to Acts 15, verse 5. But some of the believers who belonged, to, some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, and so forth and so forth. Pharisees became Christians? Priests became Christians? What happened? Isn't that a, a testimony as to the character? He's, those were truth seekers. They were immersed in something that they believed in. And when they studied and got the truth, they were willing to change. Mm -hmm. And that speaks of their character. And I think it speaks of the fact that I mean, clearly there were miracles involved here. But when they saw Peter and, and I was about to say Paul, Paul wasn't in the picture yet, Peter and John and James and the other stand up and preach those powerful sermons and they knew, they knew that what they were saying was correct. It was, it was powerful. They followed the truth wherever it led. The Holy Spirit had something to do with that also. Yes. Well, obviously. And we, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the impact of the Holy Spirit on people's lives. 
an illustration. This is from our Bible study guide. I thought this was very interesting. What do you think is going on here? An illustration of the impact of revival on daily life can be seen in the Welsh revival of 1904. Now that's 100 years ago. I know more than 100 years ago. Evan Roberts and some of his friends, okay, how many? A few people, right? Began earnestly praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They interceded, studied scripture, and shared their faith. The Spirit was poured out in response. Lives were changed. In six months, there were 100,000 conversions in the small country of Wales. 100,000, and that's relatively recent times. The results of this revival were seen throughout the country. Throughout the day, people flocked to churches by the thousands for prayer. The rough, cursing coal miners were transformed into kind, courteous gentlemen. Even the pit ponies in the coal mines had to learn new commands because the miners were not cursing at them anymore. <laughs> this is a true story. This is a true story. Transformed, obedient lives sprang from converted hearts. This is irrefutable evidence of a true revival. You can read about it in the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for July 27. What year was that? 1904. <clears throat> Could it happen in 2013? Our church has prayed for revival, mm -hmm. but it doesn't appear that anything has happened. What well, has in India mm -hmm. and several places. And, and let me just give you my personal experience. I was offered many years ago a full scholarship to, be, to take an, a master's in public health at Johns Hopkins University. So we moved there. We had just come back from Africa and we went back to Africa after that. So it was a, it was a wonderful preparation for what we we're going to go back in Afri to Africa to do. And we looked around Baltimore and we found a small church in the northern part of Baltimore that we joined. And that church was on fire. I mean, literally. We were there for nine months. And the pastor had just come there recently. He was a powerful speaker. A doctor, a personal friend of myself and my wife, we didn't know they were going to be there at all. He came and he said, well, I'd like to try an experiment. And he went to the, general, to the conference there and said, if you'll let me work for the church, you know, the church, half time, and give me half of a pastor's salary, I will, rest, I will work the rest of the time as a physician in the community and earn whatever I can hand in the community, and let's see what will happen. And we conducted five-day plans to stop smoking. That was in the days when those were really big deals. There were waiting lines to get into those five-day plans. Then we followed up with cooking schools and so forth like this. And I can tell you that in, in nine months, the, the, the church, that size of that little church doubled. And we personally invited some people to there. And they, I invited one lady to come to church, and she never stopped. The first time she showed up, she never stopped. First time she'd ever been to an Adventist church, she says, what, 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 What's it got to do with the gospel? Well, I'm, I'm talking about what happens when, when people are alive, when something's happening in church. I mean, doesn't that sound like something was happening in that church? Yeah, yeah but I don't Well, know. Jesus healed, and then he would preach. Yeah. And he healed and preached, healed and preached. Mm -hmm. That's a good pattern. Well, what is the result of a true revival? According to the, to the, what do we call it these days? We don't call it the quarterly anymore. Obedience is the fruit of, I mean, isn't that the okay. title of the lesson here? Yes. We're talking about changed lives, okay? Revival is not just warm, fuzzy feelings. A lot of people think so. A careful examination of the Gospels will reveal the fact that the disciples had the entire range of emotions while, work, while working with Jesus. Sometimes their emotions were very positive and sometimes quite negative. How did they feel in the upper room immediately after the crucifixion? So, yeah. So what are the clear evidences of revival in a Christian life? Obedience, as our quarterly suggests, really what we're talking about is living a Christ-like life. There's no way to live a Christ-like life without obedience. 
That's right. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. those those are synonymous. Obedience to what? The well, Ten Commandments, God's law, His way of life, His sense of values. Now, obedience to the call to live a Christ-like life. Yeah. See, obedience has has a sound to it that just kind of makes my skin crawl. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And there are <laughs> bad things in this world. Hitler wanted obedience. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there's just. What about know. the marriage vows of love, cherish, and obey? I like to have you explain what the word, where the word that we translate into English as obedience, what the re- yes. what the root word is, yes. and then follow through with that. So yeah. that's a good in, idea. In 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 the Greek, in the New Testament Greek. The word for obedience is hupakoe. And it's, that's very interesting because think about it for a moment. What do we mean when we say obedience? What, if I say in modern English, you need to obey, what does that mean? Usually Faultless. you don't get your way. Faultless, uh, just uh, mind numbing, just uh, do what somebody don't, tells don't, you to do. Non questioning. Do what somebody tells you yeah. to do. Mind but your the, mother, come but here now. According yeah. to the way that word is defined, it means a listening under, okay. a willingness to take instruction. Hup- yeah, hupakoe, hupo is the word for under. Hypo, we use, it, it comes in English as hypo. We think of hypodermic means a needle that goes under the skin. There are a lot of other examples of hypo, but it means under. Then akoe is a Greek word which means listening or, or sound or hearing, something like that. So hupakoe means a humble willingness to listen, literally. And if you're listening, what are you doing? Okay, well, that's the question, you see. Processing information. You, if you're really listening, if you're really listening, you, 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 you're, you're going to be changed by what you hear. There, there's another element. Mm-hmm. You have to really be listening to something of worth, mm-hmm. to someone of worth. And so you need to know God, and it's the ability to listen to someone of worth, which is God. Mm-hmm. Can that can that person that you're listening to be trusted? Yeah. Is is he is he consistent? Is is the, is the instruction you've gotten in the past consistent? Does it make sense? And then if so, then you want to learn more about it. Let me finish my my comment about the Greek word real quickly. Okay. The emphasis on of obedience in the New Testament is not on performance. It's on willingness. Now, you may not be able to do everything God asks you to do. Wouldn't it be wonderful if God could just command us and we would do everything just automatically exactly what He wants us to do? I mean, that would be fine, except that we would then be mindless robots. Uh, the, the, so God says, I want you to listen and I want you to agree with me. Then we can work on how well you can do it performing it. But I'm going to give you evidence yeah. to support what I've asked you to do. Mm-hmm. I'd like to work for just a minute on the creepy crawly feelings that you, that you got with that. To take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Christ has rest for all who will wear his yoke and learn his meekness and lowliness of heart. Here we are taught restraint and obedience, and in this we shall find rest. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even I, as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. This is the yoke which Christ invites us to wear, the yoke of obedience. And that's in That I May Know Him, page 293. So, Ken, if, if the word that we have translated from the Greek into obedience, which means willingness to listen and so forth. Mm-hmm. It must have been a word in the Greek that would be that would be used to define the obedience that we, for example, the obedience that says, "Come here now." What's the, what's the Greek word for I, that? I've never run across that word in Greek. So they didn't have that kind of an attitude. And well, maybe sometimes they did, but I, I I don't see it in the Gospels. I don't see it in the New Testament. Well, you know, Abraham was willing to listen, but he still lied. Mm -hmm. And so God wants you to be willing to listen and learn, Mm -hmm. but he knows that you will not be successful. Yeah. 
But uh, the thing that makes me crawl is that if we take that, that we know we're going to fail, but we take that as an, as, as an excuse and try to say, oh, well, it's okay if I don't do that. If we use that as an excuse for intentional misdoing, then I think we have really yeah. violated that whole process. Well, what, yeah. what kind of faith do you have if you go in thinking you're going to fail? Exactly. Well, that means you Zero. didn't want to do it in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Well, in the upper room, before the crucifixion, Peter was boldly asserting his commitment to his Lord and Master, and you all know the verses. A few weeks after experiencing that terrible denial three times and recognized what a fool he had made of himself, he was demonstrating submission, a recognition of the fact that Jesus knew him better than he knew himself. Remember on the, on the shore of Lake Galilee. But a few weeks later, after the Pentecostal experience, Peter was bold in favor of the gospel. In Acts 4 and 5, in fact, he pointed the finger directly at the Pharisees and Sadducees and accused them of being directly responsible for the murder of the Messiah. How's that for a change? You think that uh, Peter's life was changed? Now in Peter's brain, did Peter do that all or did the Holy Spirit enter his brain and give him uh, uh, an understanding and help the transformation? I think several things happened there uh, and that's a very fair question. I think Peter was willing to accept the Holy Spirit into his mind. There was that 10 day period from day 40 after resurrection to day 50 after, after the resurrection in which those people are together and they said, you know, I used to want to be, you know, vice president or whatever position, head of the ex exchange of the treasury or something. I don't want that anymore. Let's, let's put our arms around each other. Let's, let's share the Christian love, the experience we've had. Let's talk about what Jesus really did for us, the fact that he really was God, and let's go out and tell the world. And then did they say, God, here I am, use me, use my mind, use... Yeah. It reminds me of a, of a story of a former Adventist missionary. He's passed away now, Frederick Mote. You may have known him or heard him, but... He was sent to the Philippines uh, probably in the 30s to be president of the Philippine Union. He got over there and found out they already had one <laughs> and uh, didn't need one. Huh? And somehow the general conference had missed that little item. <laughs> but they did need a youth director. So it became, oh, I'll do that. Okay. Yes. Well, another example of a transforming power of the Holy Spirit was seen in the life of Stephen. Uh, let me just read a few verses about that. Look at Acts 6, starting with verse 3. So then, brothers and sisters, choose, and remember they, there was this argument about whose widows are being treated fairly or better, or all that kind of stuff. So Peter says, so then, brothers and sisters, choose seven men among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Uh, if I asked you to choose seven, of, of all the people you know, choose seven who are full of the Holy Spirit, where would you find them? Pretty thin pickings. <laughs> oh, well, I, I think there's uh, God has two thousand that have been a need of bail yeah. full of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah. Well, he said we'll put them in charge of this matter. We ourselves then will give our full time to prayer and the work of preaching. The whole group was pleased with the apostles' proposal, so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Tim Timon. Parmenas and Nicolaus, a Gentile from Antioch who had earlier become converted to, Gen to Judaism. The group presented them to the apostles who prayed and placed their hands on them. And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests accepted the faith. Were they convinced by these deacons? Was there a time when Stephen was not a believer? Oh, yeah. So he became from a non-believer to one of the men of wisdom. Yeah. Stephen, a man richly blessed by God and full of power, performed great miracles and wonders among the people. What did he do? Well, he was opposed by some men who, had, who were members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called. There was a group, there was a synagogue there especially set up for people who had formerly been slaves and now they were freed and they were Jews. 
which included Jews from Cyrene and Alexandria. They and other Jews from the provinces of Cilicia and Asia started arguing with Stephen, but the Spirit gave speech, Stephen such wisdom that when he spoke, they could not refute him. So they bribed some men to say, we heard him speaking against Moses and against law, and da 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 and you know what happened. Stephen was called before the Sanhedrin. He gave that fantastic sermon in uh, Acts 7, and then he was stoned to death. Was Stephen a former slave, or was he speaking on the behalf of the slaves? No, he was, he was, he was there converting those Jews to become Christians. Yeah. Well, could such a story be repeated in our day? Will there be people who will become martyrs for the Christian cause prior to the second coming of Jesus? Perhaps thousands each year. Could we be among them? You know, we can see martyrs, but it's almost like we can't see us doing miracles like mm -hmm. they did in the Bible. That's a little harder to envision. When the day comes and we'll have to face the devil eye to eye, will we be able to stand straight and tall and speak boldly on God's behalf as did Peter and Stephen? They did it. Depends on the circumstances we face. I'm so, talking about facing the devil. Well, how can you, I, I'm trying to imagine that. Just yeah. how would that happen? It would, can you give me a, an example of that happening? Yeah, well, I mean, I, obviously I, that hasn't happened yet, so I, I mean, I'm not a prophet, but I can imagine how it could happen, yeah. You see, the devil will come roaring like a lion, in, in Peter says. Paul, uh, um, uh, John talks about it in the book of Revelation. And basically what the situation is this. The devil will say, at, at all costs, he says to all of his followers, at all costs we must rid this world of every believing Christian. When we have rid the world of Christians, then we will turn to God and say, okay, you can have the rest of the universe, just leave this world to us. And God says, what? You will not be able to kill a single one of those Christians. And what do you think the devil will do? You think he'll be just, okay, God, whatever you say. <laughs> not a chance. He's going to be, he's going to be drilling those Christians. Revelation says that in that last time, He's going to come working miracles, causing fire to come down from heaven. There's going to be some mighty, impressive stuff. Mm -hmm. And the only defense against that will be a thus saith the Lord that what you say is wrong. And it'll be your defense of Scripture against their massive miracles that's going to be the tug of war. One little example I can think of is when a union goes out on strike, mm -hmm. to be the person who doesn't strike, who doesn't mm -hmm. believe in what they're striking for. And the pressures are unreal, even life-threatening. Mm -hmm. And right. I think that's a little glimpse. It Tiny will be glimpse. peer pressure. I think you're right. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> look at Acts 9. Let's take another example. Acts 9, first few verses. In, mean, in the meantime, Saul, and what was Saul later called? Paul. Paul. Excuse me. In the meantime, Saul kept up his violent threats of murder against the followers of the Lord. He went to the high priest and asked for letters of introduction to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he should find there any followers of the way of the Lord, he would be able to arrest them, both men and women, and bring them back to Jerusalem. As Saul was coming near the city of Damascus, suddenly a light from the, from the sky flashed around him. Now, we all know this part of the story, but I want to back up for a second. How far is it from Jerusalem to Damascus? Who knows their geography? About 75 miles or so, 100 miles. It's at least 100 miles maybe, maybe a little bit more than that, maybe 120, I don't know exactly. How did Paul get there? <laughs> Didn't fly. No. He, had he, had an walk or, he probably, probably walked. Yes. At very best, he rode a horse that distance. How long would that take? Quite a while. Five days. As, as, as a devout Pharisee, 
as a devout Pharisee. Now, by the way, was he traveling by himself? No. no. Who was with him? I think it was a military Kings. escort, wasn't it? He probably had a bunch of military people with him to bring these prisoners back home. As a devout Pharisee, he was not allowed to talk to those people, except on strict, urgent business. You mean he could not talk to his Jewish military people? Well, these are probably Roman military oh. people. Could be temple guards. Could be temple guards. So he had a lot of time to think hmm. about what he was doing. So, a light from the he sky. Planning what he was going to do when he got there sure. to to Damascus. Or but he he, he he must have been he'd been doing some thinking because remember what did God say to him? It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And what does that mean? Well, okay, that's a very old English. It means it's hard for you to kick against the goad that the that the the herd herdsmen use. To, to move along the goats and the cows. It's a sharp stick that you poke at them to get them to move. And God says, Paul, it's, you, you, you're, you're, you're tired of kicking against the sticks. In other words, God was trying to prod him and yep. he was trying to kick the stick out of God's hands. Yep. Hmm. Yeah. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? By the way, that's a very interesting point there. Who's getting persecuted? Jesus. Jesus. What is implied by that? When you touch one of his children, you're touching him. Exactly. Who are you, Lord? He asked. I am Jesus whom you persecute, the voice said. But get up and go into the city where you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with Saul had stopped, not saying a word. They heard the voice that could, but could not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground and opened his eyes, but could not see a thing. So they took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. For three days he was not able to see, and during that time he did not eat or drink anything. There was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. He had a vision in which the Lord said to him, Ananias, here I am, Lord, he answered. The Lord said to him, get ready and go to Straight Street, and at the house of Judas ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come in and place his hands on him so that he might see again. Ananias answered, Lord, many people have told me about this man and about all the terrible things he's done to your people in Jerusalem. And he has come to Damascus with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who worship you. They were, they were fully aware of what was going on already, weren't they? The Lord said to him, Go, because I have chosen him to serve me, to make my name known to Gentiles and kings and to the people of Israel, and I myself will show him all that he must suffer for my sake. I want you to think for just a second about something maybe you haven't thought about before in reference to that story. If you had just appeared in Damascus at that point in time to talk to the Christians, which would have been a bigger shock to them? One, that Paul had suddenly become a Christian or that God was sending him out to preach the gospel to the Gentiles? Both are mind-boggling. I, I don't know how you'd put those on a scale. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we, it's hard for us to imagine, you know, their, their, their mindset and think the way they were thinking, but I almost think that sending someone like Paul out to preach, the, I mean, you know, here's a guy that's the worst enemy of Christians, and all of a sudden he's not only a Christian, but he's going to be the champion for Christians to preach the, go to preach the gospel to Gentiles. And they're going, you know, what would, just happened? Who would even think to preach the gospel to the Gentiles? Right. We haven't I mean, they're both oxymorons yet. as yes. far as they're but concerned. <laughs> just so that some of our viewers know that uh, they were not allowed to even speak yeah. to the Gentiles, let alone preach to them. And Gentile meant non-Jew. Yeah, basically. Okay. Yeah. Will this technique work to, uh, with anybody? Well, I, mean, I was about to ask that question. If, well, I'm, if it works so well, why doesn't he do it? I mean, maybe one of us on our way home tonight, bazap! Mm -hmm. And also another question is, why was Paul selected? Well, did he, did he you're, have, you're, did you're, he you're have, doing really good at getting ahead of me tonight. Go ahead. Did he have, uh, did Paul have certain, maybe the reason I'm not going to get probably won't, or haven't in the past. Maybe the reason I haven't in the past received such an experience 
is that I don't have I don't have the ingredients, the talents, the the, the, the and maybe there's maybe there is talent yeah. that goes with some things. Well, let's let's think about what Paul had because that's a very fair question. One, he was probably the youngest member of the Sanhedrin. He was a part of the Senate of their day, okay? Which means that he was very intelligent and means that he was very well versed. It's, it's quite likely that he had a number of the books of the Old Testament memorized in Hebrew. And he wasn't afraid to speak his mind. And he went forth he didn't say, okay, who's going to pay my salary? He didn't say, uh, uh, whom, how many people are going to go with me to protect me? He said, let's go. Well, well you know, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Laodicea is lukewarm. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't Paul have passion? He was a passionate man. Absolutely. That's and the God word I says, to add to it. I would rather have you be hot or cold because then I can do something about you. But when you're a ball of mush and, and you just don't, <laughs> you don't, Cold neither hot like nor that. cold there's nothing I can do with you and right. and so he can take your passion and put it in the right direction yeah. well, what it, look what had happened to him he'd mm -hmm. been blinded mm -hmm. uh, and then he had a lot of time to think mm -hmm. and uh, three years he, and so uh, he, he was fearless mm -hmm. I mean he, and then he'd go out and get beat up and bruised and maybe some bones broken uh, he still kept plodding along yeah but I could imagine that one of the reasons he was on the Sanhedrin is because he was passionate about Absolutely. everything he did. Yes. And God was going to use that trait. Yeah. So what about us folks that are just a ball of mush, according to Joanne over here? What, <laughs> are we just kind of left <laughs> out here? That was a good choice, Joanne. <laughs> well, many have, and I quote from Ellen White, let me not speak Was from Moses my, passionate? I mean, yes. let's look at the people that God chose. Yeah. You know? He became passionate. He thought he was just a meek, humble shepherd. But God he was says, passionate oh. when he was young. He killed a man. Yeah. Many have an idea that they are responsible to Christ alone for their light and experience, independent of his recognized followers on earth. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the friend of sinners, and his heart is touched with their woe. He has, an, he has all power, both in heaven and on earth, but he respects the means that he has ordained for the enlightenment and salvation of man. He directs sinners to the church, which he has made a channel of light to the world. Who did he send Paul to, or who did he send to Paul? Church members. Church members, yep. When in the midst of his blind error and prejudice, Saul was given a revelation of the Christ whom he was persecuting, he was placed in direct communication with the church, which is the light of the world. Acts of the Apostles, page 122. So what happened next to Paul? He went off to think a while. And why did he do that? Did, did he go out in the wilderness or something? He went to the, we don't know exactly where, but somewhere in Arabia for you know, three years. You know, Jesus did kind of a similar thing, perhaps not as long. And was this kind of a common practice uh, for, for some for some things like this. People were doing it. I think he just had to restack all his, his it was ideas and yeah. memories and, and put everything together a different way. And it, it just was took a fruit while basket upset yeah. for Paul. Yeah. He said, man, I got to go and think this all over again. He had the, he had the, the blocks in there. He, I mean, he had the information. He just had to rethink it. Well, that's interesting that God would come down and shock him like he did, and then he had to go off for three. You know, we think, oh, he's ready to go, but mm -hmm. he's, he's confused. Is that what he is? is well, he thought he was ready to go at that time because he went right out to preach in Damascus mm -hmm. and then tried to go down to Jerusalem, and they tried to kill him a few times, so that's when he went off for three years, isn't it? Who tried to kill Paul then? No, what happened to Paul was he spoke to the church. I mean, the, 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 this Ananias experience and so forth. The very next Sabbath, he went to the synagogue in Damascus and began preaching Christianity. The very next Sabbath. And he did that for a while until he realized, you know, things are getting kind of hot here in Damascus. And then he went to Arabia. He spent about, 
well, the, the, the sum total of the time apparently was three years. So we don't know how long he preached before he went to Arabia, and we don't know for sure how long he preached after he came back to, to Damascus. So he went out there for a period of time to Arabia, maybe two years. And then he came back to Damascus, and he was preaching until they were determined to kill him. And they had to, the, the Christians had to let him down in a basket through a window in the wall in the middle of the night for him to escape back to Jerusalem. He got back to Jerusalem, and God says, you can't stay here. They're going to kill you. So then he went to Tarsus. Who is they? Was it the oh, Jewish the, the Jews. people? The okay. Jews, yeah. That's a long time to go think. You can do a lot of thinking while you're sewing tents. You have to pour over those scrolls. Did he make, ten did he make tents while he was there? Probably. Probably. Well, there are many things that happened to Paul about which we know nothing. Just look at look at Second Corinthians 11 and 12 if you're not sure about that. We know we do know that a number of people, surprising people, were converted in short periods of time by the testimony of Paul. Look at the jailer, the Roman jailer at Philippi. See, what did Paul preach to him? How did Paul convince him to become a Christian? <coughs> he, he he did some singing in the middle of the night in a prison. Now. Paul never knew Jesus directly? No. Paul just knew of the disciples and Stephen and his Damascus experience. Mm -hmm. So Paul was not a disciple. No. He was never on the, never heard the Sermon on the Mount or. No. So where did he get all that information? That's the question. Well, he, Jesus spoke to him directly. Yeah. And then, of course, he was a good student of what we call the Old Testament. So, uh, he and remember that the one of the one of the headquarters of the Christian Church after they were chased out of Jerusalem was, was Damascus. No, not Damascus. Where? What? Alexandria. Not not Alexandria. Not Antioch. Antioch. Antioch is what I meant to say. Antioch. Yeah, in Syria. Yeah. Right. Oh, but that two years of. And Arabia must have had. Oh yeah. Were there people that went and visited him there, or Peter go visit him, or? No, I think I think I, I mean I, I don't know. That's a good question. I think he did a lot of thinking himself. He probably figured a lot of it out himself. He went back. He met the disciples in Jerusalem, but he didn't stay there very long. He headed to Damascus. Probably did a bunch more thinking, and then Barnabas showed up and said, "We need your help over here in Antioch." We have to remember that on the road, on resurrection afternoon, evening, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus led those two disciples through the Old Testament yes. and told them the things that they, need, that they needed to know. Mm -hmm. Paul prob Saul probably heard those things mm -hmm. and put it all together with other things. Well, Acts, when you read about Paul in Acts, it seems like there's a lot of times when there were visitors or somebody um, telling him to go this way or that way, like an angel or something, which you never hear him write about. Mm -hmm. But it seems like everybody who wrote about him, you know, kind of pointed to those things. Well, for example, the, the dream he had in the middle of the night says, come on over to Macedonia and help us. That's he probably had a lot of visions, yeah. and yet, you know, he never really wrote about them that much. Mm -hmm. He just wrote about uh, the truth, you know, mm -hmm. is basically it, not making a big deal out of those. In, in modern times, just a few years ago, there was a rabbi who, who started to read the Old Testament, and he read himself only in the Old Testament and came to believe in Jesus because of what he read in the Old Testament. And maybe that's what, what Paul was doing. Rabbi Zwerin? Yeah. Yep. I studied with him for about four years. Yeah, right. yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, look at the example of Jesus. He certainly was the ultimate example of a spirit-guided life. From the time he was a child, I mean, Look at the couple of chapters about his childhood and desire of ages. They just blow you away. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit, anointed by power at the time of his baptism, and throughout his life apparently planned on a day-by-day -day basis with his Father and the Holy Spirit what he's going to do that day. 
Have we ever tried that? And look what's the, what Paul had to say about him under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is Philippians 2, 5 to 8, a very famous passage. The attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had. He always had the nature of God. Are we supposed to have that attitude? But he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. Now, he first of all, he, he came down and agreed to be a human being. I mean, that's an incredible, you know, incomprehensible lowering of himself. Then he said, I'm going to be a servant to men. I mean, that's another huge lowering. Not only that, what's going to, result, what's going to happen? He's right. going to end up dying the death of a common criminal. He's okay. going to get spit upon by his creation. Yeah. More the, he was more humble. The, what? Or the death of an uncommon criminal. Yeah. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. Wow. And well, yes, uh, I'm sorry, I just wanted to reiterate mm -hmm. how you started that. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And yeah. then you went yeah. through that list. So now I'm going to ask you this question. One of the things that we need to be practicing on a day-by-day -day basis is thinking like God. So now you're a member of the triune, the Trinity Committee, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There they are in heaven. Before this earth is created, and they're looking ahead, they know exactly all this is going to happen. Why would they plan for a life like this? Like like Paul or a life like Jesus? No, like Jesus. They knew what he was going to ha what was going to happen to him. They knew the whole story. Why would they plan that kind of a life? Because there was no other way to demonstrate what needed to be demonstrated that the universe might understand mm -hmm. the real effects of sin and reject it. Yeah. Wow. Well. Could we live that kind of spirit-directed, spirit-filled lives in the 21st century? Could we... Well, would you dare say no to that? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear anybody saying no. <laughs> Did you hear anyone say yes? <laughs> <laughs> well, in Romans 6, 15 to 23, Paul contrasted what it is like to be a slave to sin with what it is like to be a slave of righteousness. What kind of a person is a slave to sin? People in this century. <laughs> People in this century? And what happens to slaves to sin? They're repeating well, a type of uh, vicious cycle that they cannot get out of their sin. Well, you're talking about masters, aren't you? You're talking about a master. Every slave has a master. Yeah. So you're going to be picking your master. Mm -hmm. So. You want to pick the I know best a lot master. of people. I know a lot of people who have a master called cigarettes. Just as an example, I know a lot of people who have a master called alcohol mm -hmm. and drugs and on and on like that. And a lot of people whose master is money. Mm -hmm. Everyone will be a slave to something. Mm -hmm. To something earthly or to something heavenly. Mm -hmm. Well, in Romans 8, 12 to 17, he contrasts bondage and adoption. What's the difference between bondage and adoption? Mm. I suppose in that context, a slave was a property, was, was, he was bound, he couldn't go anywhere, he couldn't do anything. Adoption is to bring somebody into the family and, and to be part of the family. So that was quite a contrast. What, what would you say, I mean, what would, what would be the logical thing to say if someone showed up, a lawyer, let's say, showed up at your door tomorrow morning, knocked on the door and you're there, you say, come on in, and he says, I've, I've brought some adoption papers. And you say, why? He says, because God from heaven wants to adopt you into his family. And you would say, hold on, let me read the fine print. <laughs> what would you say? Hallelujah. 
<laughs> Where do I sign? <laughs> Where do I sign? Exactly. I mean, think about the things that God is offering us. I mean, how could we possibly turn it down? But then when you find out that to be that son, you have to die to what you are now. Mm. You have to die to self now in I'm, order to be mm -hmm. that son. I like my parents a lot. They're great people. But you know if I had to choose between them and God, I don't think it would be too hard to choose. You know what's amazing <clears throat> is why does God want to adopt us? Yeah. We are troublemakers. Uh, we're everything um, not good. The fortunate thing is I have a guaranteed word that he does want to adopt us. And I, I think that we have to give him <clears throat> the, the privilege of looking down the pike, looking down into the future to see what we can be mm -hmm. when we are adopted. And that glory is what drives him on. That is what, what made him do it. The potential that we have when we are yeah. sons. Well, God seems to even specialize in wanting to adopt the, um, the worst of us. Yeah. Look at these words to support that from Ellen White. At the entrance gate of the path that leads to everlasting life, God places faith. And he aligns the whole way with the light and peace and joy of willing obedience. The traveler in this way keeps ever before him the mark of his high calling in Christ. The prize is ever in sight. To him, God's commands are righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. Ellen White, Review and Herald, May 9, 1907, paragraph 2, but it's also in the little book, In Heavenly Places, page 183. The promise, and now another spot, the promise of the Holy Spirit is not limited to any age or to any race. Christ declared that the divine influence of his Spirit was to be with his followers unto the end. From the day of Pentecost to the present time, the Comforter has been sent to all who have yielded themselves fully to the Lord and to his service. To all who have accepted Christ as a personal Savior, the Holy Spirit has come as a counselor, sanctifier, guide, and witness. The more closely believers have walked with God, the more clearly and powerfully have they testified of their testimonies, I'm sorry, of their Redeemer's love and of his saving grace. The men and women who through the long centuries of persecution and trial enjoyed a large measure of the presence of the Spirit in their lives have stood as signs and wonders in the world. Before angels and men, they have revealed the transforming power of redeeming love. Acts of the Apostles, page 49. Are you saying that when we walk with God, we cannot help but be a better person and a light to the world? You can't, can't walk with God without being changed. And if you keep doing that for long enough, the change will be obvious to everyone else around. Yeah. Well, there were a few people, however, and let's look at a couple more things. There were a few people, however, who... Um, didn't always do, didn't respond to the Holy Spirit perfectly. You remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? What happened to them? They wanted to be a part of the commune, the Christian commune. And they were so anxious to do that, they said, we'll sell everything we have and we'll give it to the church and we'll join. And what did they do? They sold their stuff. They got more than they expected, Ellen White says. And they decided, well, what if we kept a little back for ourselves? A little safety net, maybe. We'll give part of it. And what happened? They walked in and lied to Peter and to the church leaders there, and they were dead on the floor. Now, was the object not that? They could have sold everything and say, we're going to give the church half. They could have. And that would have been okay. But to say, we're going to give all to the church, and then lie and keep some of them, that was their sin? Mm -hmm. They had no reason to make a commitment. Except that, I mean, they were, they were required to make a commitment. Maybe they wanted to look good in front of everybody. Yeah, okay. Go. Yeah. Why is it so difficult for us to truly learn and exhibit self-denial and self-sacrifice? It hurts. 
What does it hurt? Our pride. Of what are we supposed to empty ourselves? The kingdom of Satan is ruled by selfishness. God's kingdom is ruled by love. How difficult is it for us as naturally born selfish human beings to completely change the motives in our lives? How do we reach the place where our, high, our highest desire is to do God's will? And what is the evidence that the Holy Spirit is now in control of our lives? Could you tell if you were, in fact, living in accordance with God's will? Can you tell that? How do you tell that? Well, there's a very interesting passage in the New Testament. It's found in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Let me, let, let me read that to you. But the Spirit produces. Now, isn't that what we're talking about? We want, we want to receive the Holy Spirit. We want it to transform, the Holy Spirit to transform our lives. So what happens when a person's life is transformed? Well, the Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Those all sound like pretty good things, don't they? Humility and self-control. Now, many people, when they talk about the Holy Spirit, they say, just let the Holy Spirit come in, control my life. What is the fruit of this? What's the fruit that the, the true spirit produces? Self-control. Why, why is that? Why, why doesn't it say God control? But that only works after you are willing to be God controlled. Mm -hmm. And when you are changed into his image and into his likeness, mm -hmm. then he can hand it back and say, live like I do. What we're really talking about, and that's correct, what we're really talking about is people who have looked at Jesus long enough, have experienced enough of the Christ-like life, yes. and been guided by the Holy Spirit until they say, you know what, I wouldn't choose to walk any other way than this way, even if you gave me all the choices in the world. The, I'm going to do what's right because it is right because I recognize that's the best way to live. It's the re most, re most rewarding way to live. It's the happiest way to live. Why not choose it? When God is in control, he gives you the dignity of self-control. Yes. And the last thing God wants to do is put a steering wheel in you. And but it, it, you in know, the middle of that is, oh, how many might do a noble work in self-denial and self-sacrifice. In that God-like life, mm -hmm. God was totally selfless. Mm -hmm. We've got to come to that somehow. Yeah. So God doesn't want to control us and to, for us to be his robot. No. He wants us to control ourselves. Yeah, exactly. Well, he wants it. Let me just illustrate it like this. Maybe this will make a stick in our minds. God could... God wants to save everybody. We know that. We're all his children. He wants to save every one of us. And he could save every one of us. Even the devil he could save. All he has to do is turn heaven into a maximum security prison and put each one of us into a, you know, solitary confinement cell so we can't hurt each other. And he could save every one of us. If you equate the word save with heal, mm -hmm. I wonder if that's really possible. <laughs> well, of in course. That, in that, that's in another that illustration, yeah. I think yeah. it would the illustration. So God good. says, I'm not willing to do that. I'm not interested in having that kind of arrangement at all. I refuse to do that. So I can only take to heaven people who it's safe to have there. People who have learned by hard experience that destroying self and living a life of love is the only way to go. And he welcomes them, welcomes them into a world where everybody is motivated by love. Self-centeredness in that case would be terminal, mm -hmm. a terminal condition, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. What do you think about this? One of the attendees at an evangelistic meeting visited the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the very first time. A few days later, she commented to the evangelist that although she believed the new truths she was learning at the evangelistic meetings, she would not be returning to church. When he asked why, she said something like this. Well, you see, Pastor, in our church, the Holy Spirit is poured out each week. People speak in tongues. They have visions and they prophesy. I want to see and feel the power of the Holy Spirit in action. And I did not see it here. Hmm. This lady was certainly right to expect a, 
uh, to attend a Spirit-filled service, but her perception of the ways in which the Holy Spirit manifests Himself was certainly mistaken. In this week's lesson, we will focus especially on how the Holy Spirit is revealed in a changed life. The power of the Holy Spirit is not necessarily revealed in signs and spectacular wonders. It is always revealed in hearts that seek to do God's will. And that's from our Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Most Christians will, experience, will express a verbally a willingness to be guided by the Holy Spirit. As you look around in the church, do you see that happening in the lives of many of your fellow Christians? Where they say they want to be guided or where they're actually guided? Where they're guided? actually being guided by the Holy Spirit. Well, we wouldn't have so many divorces in the church if they were. Well, if Jesus was willing to set aside his divinity and come down to live among us, should we be willing to uh, sacrifice a little? Our, sacrifice our humanity to live like? Jesus descended from the very heights of, of the highest part of heaven and came all the way down as we've talked. To, finally, he dies the death of a common criminal. And why did he do that? So that we can come from that lowly point up there. What, what else could we possibly ask for? So what have we learned about the Spirit-filled life from the examples of Peter, Stephen, Paul, and Jesus? Do you feel more or less capable of living that kind of life? Another story. Dave and Jane claim to be committed Christians. They attended church weekly, offered a short prayer at meals, and occasionally prayed together. But somehow, something was missing in their lives. Their marriage was in deep trouble. Arguments often punctuated their discussions. The latest TV programs captivated their interest, and it seemed boring to read the Bible and pray. Through a series of unusual circumstances, this is a true story, by the way, uh, they became part of a small Bible study group. Gradually, they developed a hunger for God's Word. Over time, significant changes took place in their lives. The things about which they once so fiercely argued seemed to make little difference. Prayer and Bible study became a precious time of fellowship with God. There was a dramatic change in their thinking. The motto of their lives became Jesus. The desire of my heart is to please you. So, what about it? What's your experience? What's the experience of your Sabbath school class and your church? Which one of these examples most closely represents you? See you next week.